So look with me this morning, Jeremiah chapter 24. Turn there with us. Let's get into the Word of God here this morning. I love what I feel in this place. Presence of God's been here uh, in, in our Sunday school class. The, the glory of the Lord, the liberty uh, was there and, and all through our service. We're just going to allow God to have His way. Jeremiah chapter 24 and in verse 4. And it says, And again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, For like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah whom I have sent out of this place unto the land of the Chaldees for their good. For I will set mine eyes up on them for good and I will bring them again to this land and I will build them and not pull them down and I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I'll be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, today for this wonderful privilege that we've had to come together today in this house. I pray, Lamb of God, that you would anoint these lips of clay, God, one more time to preach this holy word. I pray, God, this morning, touch every heart and life in this place this morning, Lord, for your glory. I pray, Father, that you work among your people today and we praise you and we give you all glory and honor in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. God's here speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. He's speaking to him about some things that are present and he's speaking to him about some things that are future. He's speaking to him about what Israel, when they will return to their homeland. And the Bible said that he would give them a heart to know him. And I, I begin to look at that verse in chapter number uh, 24 and verse number 7, I believe that it is. God said that he would give them a heart that they would know him. Now you realize that for the most part in this day and hour the Jewish people do not receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. They do not accept him. There will be a day when they will. There will be a day when they will recognize that we've crucified the Lord of glory. That we killed our Messiah that came over 2,000 plus years ago gave his life for us. They'll realize that they've done that and God says I'll give them a heart to know me. Now I begin to look at that this week and this morning and yesterday begin to look at that verse that God said I would give them a heart to know me. I begin to realize when God began to bring this thought about in our spirit. I was looking at praying. I, my, actually when I went to bed last night my thought was we'd preach on prayer this morning but I can tell you friend you get to know God through prayer. You get to know him the more you pray. And I'm convinced of this. The more of God you want, the more of God you can have. And the way we get to that place is having fellowship with him. You find somebody out here that maybe you like and when you begin to interact with him, what do you do? You begin to know them. You begin to know all about them. You take a man and a woman that's been married for many years those people know one another as well as we know ourselves you can tell they don't have to tell you you can tell by the expression that they make when something's troubling them you can tell when things is not right with them you know maybe when they're sick you know when things is not going so well with them how is that because you know them I read this yesterday and today as well I read in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 1. The disciples said to Jesus, Lord teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And Jesus began to go on and give them parables there and to talk to them about prayer. But child of God, he said that he would give us a heart that we might know him. I can tell you from personal experience, there's a world of people out there that know what Christ done. There's a world of people out there today that 
know that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. They know that he gave his life there freely. They know that he was buried and put in a borrowed tomb. They know that on Easter time we celebrate the resurrection. They even pray but they do not live for him. There's people there that know about him. They know what he done. They know what he stood for but they do not live for him. I can tell you friend he gave Israel a heart that they might know him. I don't know about you this morning but I'm glad that I know him. I've heard people along the way in this life's journey. I've heard people talk about well I know so and so. Especially maybe when they get in the fix they pull rank say well I know this person. Can I just tell you something friend? I've got one that trumps every bit of that. I know the one that created the heavens and the earth. I know the one that spoke this whole big old thing into existence. I know the one that came into this world and the world received him not. I know the one that intercedes for you and I daily at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible said his Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen. Isn't that the one that we want to know? Amen. I'm glad that I know him. But I can tell you, friend, when a man or a woman receives Jesus Christ into their heart and into their life, there's a transformation that's made there. Jeremiah wrote and he's speaking for God and God said, I'll give them a heart to know me. I begin to think about that. Oh, to know him and the fullness of his power and the fullness of his glory. Brother, sister, when you grow close to him, when you begin to fellowship with him, when you begin to read his word, when you begin to get in touch with God, you begin to to know him. You know what's coming. You know how God's going to move. There's been a many a time I've been in church services. I've been up preaching. I've been working. The spirit of God would begin to move and there'd be a quietness fall across that place in the music. There'd be a quietness fall across that place with the singing. People knew what made man know that. Was it just because all of a sudden it got quiet? No sir. The spirit of God that dwells on the inside of you recognize that the spirit of God's wanting to move here and we begin to get quiet and all of a sudden there'd be a message from heaven ring to the housetop I can tell you brother that's exciting to this preacher to realize that God still demonstrates and works in that atmosphere I begin to look down here and he said that they might know me and they'd have a heart to know me I begin to realize God we need a heart after the things of God more for that than anything in this world. I read on down to you here in verse number seven and he said, I'll be their God for they shall return unto me with what? With their whole heart. Amen. He said to the children of Israel, they'll return to me, not with a part of their heart. Some of them do that from time to time. But God said, they'll return to me with their whole heart. They'll believe in me. They'll put their faith in me. They'll They'll put their trust in me. I'll be their God. Amen. I want you to know something, church. He desires to touch you and I. He desires to fellowship with you and I. He desires to be that person inside of you and I that's able to work, that's able to move, that's able to do what you and I need in our heart and our life. And I can tell you, when Christ reigns within your heart, you have a full heart. Amen. And he said that they might know me. When I read that, it just began to just saturate my spirit and I began to realize how much God desires to know you and I. Now when God, when you know God, and God, we know God knows us, but what happens to a man? When a man or a woman knows God, you were lost and undone. You realize that a man or a woman is born into this world in sin because of the fall of Adam and Eve. That's just simplistic preaching, but that's just a fact. We were born sinners. We needed a redeemer. Christ Jesus gave his life freely on the cross of Calvary that if you and I would receive
receive him. Now I want you to know something this morning. The Holy Spirit draws us and he quickens our heart and our life and he draws us to Christ. And we receive that. We receive Christ into our life when we repent. What are you admitting when you repent? You're remitting God. You're admitting to God what God already knows. When you repent, you admit to God what God already knows. But you're saying, I am a sinner, Lord, and I have failed you through in this life of mine. I failed you many times but I'm asking you Lord to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you Lord to forgive me of the problems maybe the life that I've lived. I want you to know something friend. You, you can't repent of all your sins because they've been many and we don't even know how many. But we can ask Jesus to forgive me of my sin. That one, that all of it that covers it all. Amen. Because he died there on the cross of Calvary. He paid the price when we repent of our sin. Ask Jesus into our heart. What are you doing? Now you're believing and you're asking him to do what? To live on the inside of you. You're asking him now to give you a new heart. You're asking him now to make you a new person, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you something, friend? When a man or a woman knows Christ, there's a transformation that happens in their life. There's something different about them that wasn't what it was a few weeks ago. I've got a, in this side of this building, I've got a lot of friends that I grew up with. I've got I've got a lot of these guys that I run around with when I was growing up and, and, and they know me probably better than a lot of you do. Amen. They know you and they can tell you there's a difference there. Why? Because they see the life and, and I can see much difference and much change in their lives as well. Why? Because of who lives on the inside of us. Oh yes, we still look the same. We've still got some of the same old clothes. I, I, I probably got some that's 20 years old. I, I know, I probably should have got rid of them a while. But I've got some I'm sure that I had when I was lost and undone in this world. But I can tell you something, friend. Even though we may dress the same, we may, may I know we've aged a little since then. We may look a little the same in the difference. But there's one thing that's new on the inside of us now is a heart that loves loves God. Amen. It's a transformation and it makes a difference in your life. Why is that? Because of the touch that you receive from the master. Amen. Oh, I begin to think about that, the transformation that comes into our life. Let me read you a scripture here that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. It says this in Acts 3 and 19. Now notice what it says. It says, repent me therefore and be what? Be converted. Whoa. Repent you therefore and be converted. What does that word converted mean? That means to be changed. He said, repent you therefore and be converted. Now notice this. He said that your sins may be blotted out. He said, for when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So when we repent therefore and be converted, when we're changed, it said that your sins may be blotted out. It says, for when the times of refreshing shall come. Now we like times of refreshing, do we not? We like that when the times of refreshing come. We like that when God pours his spirit out into us and God moves in our heart and in our life. But he goes on to say this. He said, for when the times of refreshing shall come. Where are they coming from? We have a world out there that look for all sorts of things. He said the times of refreshing shall come from where? From the presence of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, there ain't anywhere on this earth that I'd rather be than in the presence of the Lord. I've been praying and talking to God before driving down that road at work and would just pull over because God's presence was so rich, so real, so wonderful that I didn't want anything to spoil that. I've come to the place a lot of times where I'd reached my destination and I didn't even want to get out of the truck and interfere because of the presence of God that was there. There. I've been in a lot of church services, church where I didn't want to go home because of the presence of God was so rich, so real, so wonderful. I can tell you the touch of God makes a difference. The touch of God and his presence transforms a man. 
Those things come through repentance. You can have that type of intimacy, relation, intimacy and a relationship with Christ in that manner. People say, well, preacher, can you really know God like that? Yes, you can. Because he teaches you and I through the word of God, if I will. Now notice that. There's a hinge on that. If I will draw nigh unto him, what's the Bible say he'll do? He'll draw nigh unto us. But let me, let me just go on to tell you this. But if I don't draw nigh unto him, then he won't draw nigh to us. But if I want him, I can have him. If I want his presence in my life, if I want the fellowship and the blessings of God, and I draw near to him, the Bible says he'll draw near to us. Now that's a commandment for the child of God. He goes on to say, he said, seek and you'll do what? Find. Knock and it'll do what? He said, it'll be opened unto you. That's commandments that's given to you and I to live by. That's commandment that God says, if you want me, if, you, if you've come unto me, he said, come unto me all of you that are weary and heavy laden and he'll do what? Give us rest. But he goes on here and he says, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. I don't, yours may not have been like mine, but mine, there was a big blot there. And it said, and when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. I've been in a lot of places where I didn't know what to do. I've been in a lot of life circumstances where I didn't know what to do. I've been in places where fear has gripped my heart. I've been in times, I've been in circumstances where if I could have just opened the door and ran, I would have just opened the door and ran. But I knew I couldn't do that. But I've also learned this. There's something that we as men and women of God must realize. That if we will pray and touch heaven... There is a peace, the Bible says, that surpasses all understanding. I've got a great friend right now. Unless God intervenes, does a miracle in his life, he's fixing to leave this walk of life before very long, and he knows that. He sent me a text the other day. And he said, I have never had so much peace in all of my life. Hallelujah. About a year and a half ago when he went and began in this deal that he's going in, is into, and I, I talked with him and fellowshiped with him. I told him, I said, brother, I said, I can tell you something. I said, whatever you and I face... We live in for God. Whatever you and I face, we're not going to face that alone because of the presence of God. I can tell you, brother and sister, there's a peace that surpasses all understanding. And what makes that peace in your life? It's God's presence. How do we get that presence in our life? By fellowship with Him. By fellowshipping with Him. It transforms you. It makes you into a person that you one time were not. We live in society right now when, and I've had so many times, and I've mentioned this many, many times over. I've had a world of people to say to me, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. I've seen people in the church like that. Don't raise your hand or don't say amen, but I have. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. Oh, it, 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 listen to me. It only gets better for the child of God. Amen. Only, only thing this, what you and I must stay focused on, it's not the life that we're living here, but it's the life that we'll live in the hereafter. Because the life that I'm living here, the Bible said man's days on this earth, they're few and they're full of trouble, and we can say a big hearty amen to that. But I can tell you, friend, in the afterlife of this thing, if we're born again, blood bought, child of the king, we can rejoice on what awaits you and I. It's 
It's not what that house you got down the road, but it's a heavenly home that Jesus said in the 14th chapter of the book of John that he's going away to prepare for you. Now, brother, you can rejoice in that right there. It's a place where the moth will not corrupt. It's a place where you'll never need a termite inspection. It's a place where a thief can't break through and steal, nor a fire can destroy it. It's been built by the master's hand. Not only is it a place of security, not only is it a place of peace, not only is it all that our mind can or cannot imagine, but it's a place where the Son of God is. And I can tell you, brother, when we're there, there's peace and there's life in the presence of God. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. But his touch makes a difference. I read this morning in, the, in Matthew's gospel, I want to read this to you in Matthew chapter 8, if I can find it right quickly. In Matthew 8 and verse number 3, this is a story here in Matthew 8 and 3, and it says this. And let me begin here in verse number 1. It says, And when he was come down from the mountain, a great multitude followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand, and he touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. Now, I'm going to stop right here for a moment of time and mark my place where I'm at. Jesus just went again what the law would say about that. First and foremost, he is in contact with a leper. That was against the law. But what did Jesus do? He come to fulfill it. He come to fulfill. He came to do what the law couldn't do. He came there. This leper comes to him. He said, Lord, if thou canst. Now, I'm going to tell you something. He's speaking some powerful words because he's speaking to the only one that can. If thou canst but heal me, the leper says. Jesus says to him. Now, but I want to back up before I get into that. Just one moment of time. And it says, and, and, he, and Jesus put forth his hand, and he touched him. Jesus touched a leper. Now, under the law of Moses, the leper was not supposed to come in contact with anybody because when he did, he was to cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. But he cried out and he said, Lord, if you can heal me, will you heal me? And Jesus touched him. Don't you know that at that very moment of time, what a transformation that it happened. And it goes on, listen to what it says. And Jesus said, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. We serve a God that can do it immediately. Child of God, when this leper said to him, he said, Lord, if you can heal me, Jesus said, and he touched him. And he, the Bible said, and immediately he was cleansed and his leprosy was healed. What made the difference? There was a healing there from the touch. I was reading this morning of the little lady with an issue of blood that came behind in the press. Jesus is going to Jairus' house. And this little lady, what does she do? For many strong in him, many reaching out to him. She reached out and she touched him. Now Christ stopped in the midst of his stride. Christ stopped in the midst of the multitude and he said, someone touched me. Not only does he touch, but she's touched him. She now has placed her life in a very vulnerable place because it was against the law, first and foremost, for anyone with an issue of blood to be out in a crowd like that, but to reach out and to touch a lady, to touch the hem of the garment of a man. That didn't work, but what did Jesus say? He stopped and he said, someone's touched me. And I can imagine the fear on that lady's face when she said, I did. 
Jesus perceived within himself something had happened. What did he perceive? Virtue had departed or had left him and touched her. What a difference the touch of Christ made in the heart of this little lady with an issue of blood. For many years had tried many physicians but only grew worse. She's broke and she's dying. But with one touch, she's alive through Jesus Christ. I come to a close this morning with this. For the man or the woman that doesn't know God spiritually, they are dying. But to the person that knows Jesus Christ as Lord, they are alive. This lady was passing from this life, passing through this life. And she was dying physically. But one touch of his garment brought physical life and spiritual as well. This was part of her Sunday school text this morning. Being confident of this very thing. For he that which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Musicians, would you help me today, please? He who has begun a good work in you, his touch not only transforms us, his touch not only heals us, but his touch keeps you and I till he returns. Folks, and as we sit by and I look at this world today, I see things that trouble me. I don't care to admit that to you. I do. I see so much going on in society. It bothers me. But I see from day to day almost people going through life and they feel like they're in despair they feel like they don't know what, what next to do hey some folks sitting in this house this morning right now in your life you feel, feel as alone as you've ever felt in your whole life. When I said what I said a moment ago, when I said there'd been times in my life I could have just opened the door and just ran. You can identify with that. Hey, some folks sitting right here this morning, if you could just walk out and close the door on it. Put it behind you. You would do it. Listen to me. I got an answer for you. His name's Jesus. You can be a good person. Be a good friend, a good neighbor, good mom or a good dad, good husband and a good wife. But to make heaven your home, it takes a relationship with Jesus Christ. Sitting across this building somewhere today, somebody right here needs God to touch their life. From I don't know what time this morning, but early. And I'm certain from six o'clock on, 
God's just been pouring that into my spirit. You just need God to touch you. You need some things changed in your life and you've tried every road out there. But it always leads you right back to that same old mess. Can I ask you something? Will you turn your life over to Jesus Christ? Will you repent of your sin? And ask him into your heart to live and to be Lord. He's a God that changes people. Psalter's open right now. I want to ask you this morning, if you sit across this building, you're lost without him. Would you come and give your life to him this morning? You say, God, I can't do this anymore by myself. I need you. I need you, Lord. I need the strength to go that mile that I'm going. I need the touch in my life, God, the peace there that you promised me your presence would bring. God's speaking to you right now. Swallow that old pride. Say, God, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. This altar's open right now. This altar's open right now. Come on. Come on. That's it, ladies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it.